Alright, good evening. Praise the Lord. It is a beautiful day. I want to share some things with you that the Lord uh, has been putting in my heart heavily this last week. Um, you know, some things have happened over the past few days, and uh, you know, both spiritual and personal. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he's been talking to me a lot this past few days, or maybe I'm listening better. And I want to start by reading Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling. You know, when we think about this, we often wonder what that calling is. That calling is our new identity. Suzanne spoke about this not too long ago. And then James recently said something about watching our words. You know, we need to be careful of what comes out of our mouths because our words have power. So we have to watch what we say. We have to make sure that we know what the Lord calls us. So he calls us blessed. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. He calls us healed, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, verse 5. He calls us prosperous. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them, that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Psalm 106, verses 4 and 5. And he calls us his children. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John chapter 1 verse 12. So when we think about the, what the Lord calls us, it reminds me of Abraham. So let's take him for example. Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 through 8. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God so God told Abram you're no longer Abraham, you're now Abraham, the father of a multitude of nations. So when Abraham started calling himself Abraham, as God told him his new name would be, he was calling into existence those things that do not exist. As it says in Romans 4, verse 17. So with our words, we call those things from the spiritual realm into the physical realm. We call ourselves what God calls us. So remember this, you are not what people say you are, you are what God says you are. Amen. So we need to renew our mind to these things. We need to claim what is ours, and we have to do it today. This is the day that the Lord has made. Psalm 118, verse 24. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it be separate, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters from under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. This is the day that the Lord has made. You see where I'm going with this? And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation plants, yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And God said, let, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, fourth day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps up on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the, fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. So God created my, man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fulfill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you the every plant I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every birth of the bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Everything that God made was, is good. With his word, he formed the entire universe. We have that same power inside of us. We need to claim everything that is ours according to God's word today, because today is the day that the Lord has made. Yeah, amen. So that's what the Lord's been dealing with me for the past.
past few days. Uh, anyone has anything to share? Heavenly Father, we thank you for letting us be in your presence. Father, we thank you because you give us your word. Lord, you created this entire universe. Everything that we see, hear, feel, taste, everything was created by your word. And that is the same word, Lord, that we have, that we can speak because we have your spirit living in us. So right now, Father, I am declaring that all of those that are in need of healing, that healing is manifested right now, Lord, in your mighty name, Jesus. Because we have that authority on this earth. You have given it to us, Lord. For the sacrifice of the cross. We thank you, Father, for your goodness, for all the promises, for calling us your children, for calling us blessed, healed, prosperous. Lord, we are your creation. We are here on this earth to worship you, to serve you, to trust you, and believe in your word, Lord, a word that is coming true every day. The word has never failed. Thank you, Father, for the victory that you have given us through Christ, for the salvation that you have given us, this covenant that you made, swearing unto yourself.
kids are born, you have infant, toddler, preschooler, and all those stages of human growth. I feel like I'm transitioning to my next stage, spiritual. That's where I am right now. So let the growth continue Amen. so that I get to where he wants me to be. October 9th, 7 p.m., we have our Eastern Gate House of Prayer, focusing on the Hebrew quote. All right. <laughs> it's all over me, so I just, like I said, it's going to unpeel in my ears. So finish work. It's been launching into finish work. Amen. I'm learning the wrong things and start walking in the right thing. <laughs> it's happening. Okay, well, let's speak the word tonight. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Hallelujah. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Hallelujah. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord reviews the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Brother Tim, would you mind taking the offering, please? Earthquakes in the buildings falling from 
Show me your face. 
there's a cry that stirs our hearts and Praise God. Father, we love You tonight. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You for Your goodness, Your grace. Thank You for Your long-suffering, Lord. We just thank You, Lord, for every blessing, for Your faithfulness to us, Lord. We exalt You tonight and magnify You, Lord. We just bless Your name. 
But you are a great and a mighty God, Lord. There's none like you. We worship you. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you all. Be seated. Thank you for being here tonight. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. I was, uh, I was telling Mike when I got here, I want us to pray for this family over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, I've had some issues with them in the past. They've, they're just really not very responsible people, but then that's not un unlike uh, a lot. But I've had problems with them using our parking lot for a overflow for them and to work on vehicles and everything else. So I had a discussion with the man uh, a few months back and I just told him, when we have church services, you can't park here. This is private parking, it's for the church and for guests. And if you need to use the parking lot, if you have visitors or something and you need a place to park, just ask me in advance so I can make arrangements so I know you know, as long as it's not a church service night, it's cool. So I pull in tonight, and they're unloading tires, and they got trucks all over out there and everything else. And I said, Man, you're going to have to move those trucks. It's church night. And they flips, he flips out on me and starts cussing me and threatening me. Well, I don't take threats very well. So I went right over there and told him, look, this is our property. I don't know what part of that you don't understand, but this is private property and you're not allowed to park here when we're having church services. So then he started cussing and threatening me, and I said, you know, I just told him. <laughs> he said, or else, and I said, or else what? Now, I'm a Christian, but I have limits, praise the Lord. And uh, so... I just told him, I said, look, that's, you know, I'm trying to be reasonable here, but you're being irresponsible, and uh, that's all there is to it. This is our property. How would you like it if I started telling our people to park in your parking space, in your driveway? I mean, I'm only being reasonable here. I'm not trying to be a jerk. But he flips off anyway. And it's, then he starts doing what people always do, and, oh, that's some kind of Christian. And I said, and now you're the judge of Christianity. I said, I, I, just because we're Christians doesn't mean we have to be taken advantage of and run over. I'm not trying to be a jerk, but, you know, people just, you know, they, they, they come and tear things up and destroy things and just think you're supposed to just go, oh, well, praise the Lord. Well, I'm sorry, but it doesn't work that way. This stuff costs money. It costs to repair it. It costs, you know, and we're a small church, and, you know, it, it just gets really old after a while. So pray for me, but pray for them. Amen. Uh, I mean, seriously, I, I understand they, they've got their own world that they're living in. And uh, we've reached out to them many times, the kids and other things. And uh, so I, it isn't about them being a part of this church or not being a part of this church. They have a right to do or don't do whatever they want to do. But they don't have a right to abuse and take advantage of our property. And uh, we've got siding that needs to be repaired now and gutters and everything else because the kids, I've caught them multiple times climbing and tearing stuff up just because their parents won't tell them you shouldn't do that on other people's property. And I've been tolerant and I haven't you know, freaked out on the kids and I've even actually gave them little jobs to do around here thinking that if I kept them busy, they wouldn't be as destructive. Help, they weeded me, helped me weed out here, and I gave them a few bucks. And so, you know, this is the world we live in. That if if you tolerate and try to be kind and patient with people, the sad truth is a lot of them just want to take advantage of that. So, let's pray for them. I don't know their names. I think what I forget his. I met him months back, and I, I, he told me his name, but I can't remember it now. But anyway, the Lord knows. Father, we just ask you to bless this family. Lord, help them to come to a saving knowledge of the truth. Help, help us to be the witness we need to be, to know the difference between loving and, and just being uh, silly. 
and, and ignorant. You know, there are times, Father, that you have impressed on us to take a stand. And, uh, Lord, I just want your will to be done. I want you to bless them and to help them to come to the knowledge of you, a saving knowledge, Lord. Bless them. Whatever they set their hand to, Lord, prosper them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, I vented. Hallelujah. My wife is looking at me like, yeah, okay. Well, this is the way it is, folks. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, but, you know, I, when it comes to this, I, I deal with this every week on an ongoing basis. It just gets to where I get so aggravated, and I just let it go and let it go, let it go, thinking that things are going to clear up by themselves, but they don't. So uh, sometimes, praise the Lord, uh, I respond, hallelujah. I don't mind somebody being upset or, you know, uptight or whatever, but when you start trying to threaten me and, you know, what you're going to do and all this kind of, that, that just, that's the end of this, you know. I mean, I just don't have time for that. I'm not going to tolerate it, so... Praise the Lord. I don't, not, I don't want to make the register. You know, pastor has a fist fight in the church parking lot with a neighbor. I don't want that to happen, believe me. But, you know, I'm, I'm still human, and I do have buttons that can be pushed, and sometimes they just go too far, praise the Lord. So, Anyway, glory to God. He's still on the throne. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And you might ask, why does he preach grace? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Because like everybody else, I need it. Praise the Lord. And I do want to talk to you tonight about that very thing. And I know that you know, it, it, there are plenty of things that you can get off into, and, and, and it's all good. I mean, if it's biblical, it's Bible, it's good. But just like what Roberto was saying uh, tonight, and Mike talking about Hebrews 12, we, we really, as a people, need to understand this so that we can really t operate in the totality of who we are and what we are in Christ. Now, if, if you all, you know, feel bad about me right now, you know, just get over it. It's okay. It's everything's good between me and the Lord. Amen. But I'm just being honest with you. I mean, I, th I try to be that all the time. So I don't try to cover stuff up. I don't try to pretend like I'm something I'm not. I'm a human being. And uh, you know, so... Praise the Lord. I try to be as loving and patient and so forth with people as I possibly can, but sometimes it just, you know, sometimes I'm like everybody else. Sometimes you just got me at a bad time. This wasn't a good time to be acting like an idiot, you know, so praise the Lord. Uh, so I need your prayers, hallelujah, like everybody else does. But anyway, grace is something that is so, uh, it is the gospel. It is what the gospel is about. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Just not, not just for the sake of another grace message, but to kind of make sense out of why it is that I focus so much on this. And it is because until, you know, we think we, a lot of times we have understanding and information, and it isn't, it really, most times it isn't revelation until we actually walk in it, until we actually are experiencing it in a human experience. In other words, how, how we relate and how we deal with things. So uh, unless we have that understanding, it's going to be very difficult for us to, to produce the kingdom wherever we are because of a lack of confidence or uh, expectation of God. Now, I, I've learned over the years that God's blessing, as far as I'm concerned, as far as for me personally, has never been predicated by based on my behavior or my perfection. Now, it makes a difference to me because I feel bad when I act up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But God's okay with it. I mean, he understands me. He loves me, and that's okay. But that's, that's if, if I were to go by my own personal feelings about things, I would feel like, okay, well, now, now I, I, you know, God's not going to do anything because I've been a bad that's not the way it works. That, that isn't the way God operates. And so let's begin with Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. And this may seem elementary, but the truth is this gospel message is the power of God, not only for salvation, 
that what we think of as salvation in terms of going to heaven and having our sins forgiven, but that word is sozo, so it's covering everything. It's, it, it, it's, the gospel is the power of God for our healing, for our deliverance, for our uh, Christian maturity, for our salvation in terms of going to heaven and escaping the punishment that we deserve for our sins and so on and so forth. So there's way more to this than just a pass from hell. So let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, the, the punishment that Jesus received on our behalf was a complete punishment for all sins, for all of our sins, amen? Past, present, future, amen? And it cleared the way for a free flow, a continuous, ongoing flow of God's mercy to us. Praise the Lord. This is a good God that we're serving. And the cross and our trust in the cross, they're like a gate that's being opened and a gate that's being entered. Praise the Lord. L let's look at this. Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 21 and 22. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So Christ is our righteousness. I've heard it described as, you know, the, the scripture talks about he gives us a robe of righteousness. That's literally just being in Christ is what that is. That's what he's trying to pro, uh, project to us. To be in Christ is to have to be clothed with Christ or to be robed in his righteousness. Amen? So you cannot be born again and not be the righteousness of God in Christ. It's impossible. Praise the Lord. So Christ is our righteousness. He makes us blameless and he makes us above reproach. And when we agree with that, our conscience should be satisfied. Amen? If I agree with what that scripture says here, then my conscience should be satisfied in the work of the cross in the same way that God is satisfied yes. completely. Right? Now, it sounds simple, but this is, it's, it's key to our moving in the things of God, to really operate in the power of God's Word. Amen? Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Let me read that again. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen? So the blood of Christ is a cleansing blood. We know that. We, we sing songs about it. We've talked about it, amen, all of our Christian lives. It washes away wrath, and it removes the stain of self-condemnation. Amen? It takes away the wrath of God, and it washes away self-condemnation. That's what these scriptures are telling us. Amen? Christ died to remove our shame, as well as God's anger. Praise the Lord. Look at this, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He dealt with the shame. He dealt with condemnation. He dealt with guilt. Romans chapter 9 and verse 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Amen. Praise the Lord. We were enemies of God. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. I, was ta I talked about it Sunday. God is in pursuit of his enemies to win his enemies. Yeah. Amen? God's better at this than I am. He's been at it longer, praise the Lord. He knows how to do it. But that's God does. He goes after his enemies to win them. 
Praise God. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Amen? We're at, we're at peace with God. Amen? Proverbs, uh, 30, or Proverbs 3 says, We shall sleep in peace. Why? Because when we wake up, we know that His mercy is ours. His mercies are new every morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we can go to bed at peace with God and with ourselves. Praise the Lord. Because His mercies start all over again in the morning. Clear, clean slate. Praise the Lord. I mean, this is good news. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Amen? In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Come boldly to God. I can come as boldly to God tonight and have access and expect blessings from God as any other time. Right. Right. Amen? Yeah. has nothing to do with God. Right. Praise the Lord. 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. I think, you know, one of the, to me personally, I think one of the, one of the things we need to, uh, be more than anything else is honest. I mean, we're look. Uh, I'd like to say that I always have it totally, and I don't want to make this about me tonight. But obviously, this is on my mind. So I, it's just that none of us are without flaws. Anybody ever lose your temper? I mean, anybody ever? Okay, praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, sister. But you understand what I'm saying. Well, maybe for one person that might be it. For somebody else it might be something else. But I'm saying I think it's far better for us to confess our faults one to another than it is to try to pretend like I'm perfect and I never have a problem, you know, and, you know, so I'm always great. Y'all are all messed up, but, you know, come on, just you might get good like me eventually. You know what I'm saying? I just think it's better as Christians to be real than it is to be phony. And that doesn't mean we ought to just act like heathens and crazy, but there are times when you might get crazy. I mean, you might just lose it a little bit. It doesn't make you unsaved. It doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a human being. This is why Jesus came. Because we are flawed. He's flawless. And the world needs to know that our perfection is not us, it's Him. Yes, I want to be a good person. I want to present the right uh, you know, image and be a, a reflection of God and Christ, and I try to do that. But I'm not perfect at it. Amen? It's like Tim said. I'm not, believe me, I'm not where I would like to be in terms of perfection, but I'm a long ways from what I used to be. I mean, I wasn't always a Christian, praise the Lord. And... Uh, Hallelujah. So we're, we're renewing our minds because there's a tendency in all humans to revert back to the path of least resistance. Right. Amen? Push, you push back. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, it's just that tendency to just kind of drift back to the, 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 the easiest reaction, the easiest kind of attitude and behavior. Praise the Lord. So, beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. How many can say amen to that? As long as you're, you know, everything's going great, it's easy to believe that God's going to be blessing you, right? You can have confidence that God's going to do what God has promised in His Word, right? And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Amen? amen. So the benefits of believing is having a clean conscience, clear conscience. 
and a radical confidence to approach God. Amen? All right, let's look at this in Matthew chapter 7, and we'll read verses 7 through 11. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask, and it'll be given you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it'll be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? If he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Praise the Lord. So the way is opened. The gate is opened. And we've entered, and we are now called the children of God. God has just told us what he does. Amen? Praise the Lord. And it isn't based on our performance. It's based on our identity. His children. And if we give good gifts to our children who we know are not always well-behaved and always doing the right thing and everything else, but it's in our heart to do things for them because we love them. They're, our, they're ours. Right. Family, you know. Yeah. How much more is what he's saying then? Does your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Praise God. So I, look, I know as well as anybody does that this sense of liberty and freedom can rise and fall. One day you may feel like, whoa, I'm, you know, hallelujah. And the next day you just don't feel that much liberty. You're feeling, you know, and one of the reasons is our conscience isn't completely informed about the gospel. That's why I'm preaching the gospel. Amen? Because we think that we have it, but in fact I know in my own life, my freedom, my liberty in God and Christ, it is not consistent. Some days I feel more sure that God is going to do whatever God said he would do. Amen. I have more confidence because I'm trusting, amen, in what God has said, not in what I'm thinking, not in my own conscience. Our conscience, amen, needs to be completely and totally informed about the gospel in order for us to operate, amen, the way God intended us to. It needs, it needs training in, the, in righteousness in terms of the human experience. Amen? Amen? We need to regularly reassure our hearts. That's what I'm doing. I'm not just doing it for you. I'm doing it for me. I can't preach without preaching to me. Amen? And so uh, every time we do this, what we're doing is we're reassuring our hearts of God's grace, of our confidence in God, and if God's love for us, so that we, have, we can come boldly with a clear conscience, even though there are things that are not perfect in our life. And yet we can still come boldly to the throne of grace with a conscience that says, uh-oh, you're no point in coming in here today because God's going to be upset. No, with a clear conscience. And that's why we preach the gospel, is to continually, regularly cleanse our conscience, amen, of evil of wrong thoughts about God's response to me or to us. Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord. 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. 20. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. So we need to basically wrestle our consciences into alignment or into conformity to the cross. 
Praise the Lord. You know, there are people that think, you know, this is just, this is a pass. This is just a, an escape for bad behavior. No. It's, if we understand it, the way the scripture is teaching it, the way Jesus presented it, and the way Paul did, and throughout the Gospels, the way God through the Holy Spirit has brought it to us in his word, is that this, this whole idea of God's favor and God's grace and God's goodness and God's mercy is based on the gospel. Amen? And it's about the cross. It's about conforming to the work of the cross. Amen? This isn't my private interpretation. This is what the cross was about. It wasn't just about Jesus dying so we go to heaven. It's the whole the whole departure of God's anger towards us or us, our separation from God based on us. God so loved the world that he gave so that we, even in our flawed condition, can come boldly to him because he wants this family. He, he loves us. And that's what the cross is about. And that's why the cross has to be constant. We have to eval evaluate our relationship, our understanding of grace, and our uh, you know, human experience in relationship to the cross. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 again. That's where, where we started out. But let's look at this again just for a moment. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Did Christ atone for our guilt? If he didn't, then the gospel's not true. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, this is a perfect example tonight. I'm not going back into this. I'm just saying, sometimes stuff happens for a reason. Sometimes it happens just because I'm stupid, but sometimes it happens actually for a reason. Amen. It happens because I'm stupid, but then God shows me a reason for it. Praise the Lord. The cross and the results, the resulting forgiveness is to make us God-centered, not self-centered. Forget about forgiving yourself. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, we've always said, oh, you know, the problem is I can't forgive me. Well, that probably is the problem because God doesn't have a problem forgiving you. Right. Amen? If, 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 my, if there is an atonement for guilt, then the gospel isn't true and it, all the rest of this is insane. So, my first issue is don't worry about forgiving myself. I may have a problem with that. Amen? Right, we, we have problems sometimes forgiving ourselves because we want to be good. We want to be right. We want to be perfect. But God doesn't have a problem forgiving us. We have a problem forgiving us. Amen? The cross resulted in forgiveness. And the reason for the cross and the resulting forgiveness is so that we will be God-centered and not self-centered. So I'm not looking to me for my answers. I'm looking to God. God gives the answer. God is the answer. The cross is the evidence of it. If God is satisfied, then who cares if anybody else is satisfied? Amen? Who cares what other people think? Who cares what I think? God's okay. He's forgiven. So if I'm struggling with it, that's my problem. But it's not a problem with God. It's not a problem with me approaching God. Right. So the sooner I just let go and move on, the better. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. Forgetting those things which are behind, even if they were only five minutes ago. Right. We move on. We press toward the mark. What is that? It's Christ. Yeah. The high calling of God in Christ. So what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? All right, verse 33. Uh, let's look at 33 through 35, Sheila. 
Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? We could go on and on, but that's, we know the scripture, right? That is our confidence. Don't question the sufficiency and the effectiveness of the work of the cross. That's what we do when we do all this self-evaluating and critiquing of ourselves and judging ourselves among ourselves and by ourselves. Amen. We're, we're actually, in reality, what we're doing is questioning the sufficiency or the effectiveness of what Jesus did on the cross. Now, Look at this again, Matthew chapter uh, 12, verses uh, 31 and 32, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, when I was first in church, in, in, in a Pentecostal church, I was led to believe that that was about spiritual work. In other words, uh, laying on of hands, casting out devils, uh, speaking in tongues, tongues and interpretation, all of those things. If, because obviously that was what was being promoted by the Pentecostal churches, which is, which is true, it's good. But they were basically implying that if you didn't agree with those works of the Spirit, then you were blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But that's really not what this is talking about. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Amen? So, what's it mean? I mean, what... What is he talking about speaking against the Holy Spirit? Well, let me show you. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, notice this, the blood of Christ, through, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Amen? 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So believing the truth and committing uh, to trust in Christ is called sanctification of the Spirit. Right? Believing in Jesus, committing our trust to Christ in the Scripture, that is what's called sanctification of the Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Now look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Praise the Lord. So in a nutshell, what God won't tolerate is the sin of discounting the great work of God's accomplishment by the Spirit, which is the cross. Not because God comes and gets you, but because without that, you can't be saved. Right. Right. 
It isn't like God just decides, well, I'm going to get these people because they're... No, if you're not sanctified by the Spirit of God through the blood of Christ, then you're not saved. So it's the thing that can't be forgiven because you haven't responded in faith, right? Thank the Lord. Amen. It's saying the work of the cross, in other words, it's saying that the work of the cross is insufficient or unnecessary. That's the problem. That's what he's talking about when he says that won't be forgiven. You can, you can blaspheme the, the, the Son of Man, you can blaspheme you know, God, but not the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one, the, the, the activator of all of this. Jesus said the Spirit of God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach this gospel. Then he goes on to say, it's not me that does the work, but it's the Spirit that's in me. He's doing the work. He's the motivator. He's the one who leads and guides. Amen? So if you, if the, the Holy, in other words, the cross would have never happened without the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. Amen? So if you reject the Holy Spirit, you're rejecting the sufficiency and the, the efficacy, if you will, of the cross. That's why he says that. That's why he brings it up. It's saying it wasn't enough. You know, okay, it was enough for Tim, but it's not enough for me because I got problems. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not picking on you, Tim. I just, you're there, so I got you. Amen. But you know what I mean? It, it, it's enough for John because he's got his act together, but it, it's not enough for me. Well, either it's enough for everybody or it's not enough for anybody. Right. Praise the Lord. It is sufficient. Amen. It's saying that the work of the cross isn't either isn't sufficient or it's not necessary. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 29. One more scripture here, and then we'll wrap it up. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. What is that willful sin? It's to reject the finished work of the cross. Amen? All sin's been dealt with. The only sin that we have to worry about is unbelief in Christ. To reject the finished work. To say that it isn't enough. That it's insufficient. That it won't do what God said it would do. And if we ever get it totally understood, then we will come boldly to God. We will know that it is finished. It's all good between me and God. There's nothing that I cannot expect God to do in my life based on the finished work of the cross. It was enough. It was enough to give me confidence in God, amen, and peace with my own flaws, my own lack of perfection. Not that I should be content with that, but that even though it's there, it doesn't hinder me from approaching God with confidence that God's going to bless me. Amen? That he has forgiven me and has no more consciousness of sin as far as I'm concerned. God doesn't have it. I do. That's my problem. It's not his problem. Amen? But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. That's, what, that's the alternative. If you don't accept the finished, total, unadulterated, finished work of the cross, what you have left what you end up with is a fear of judgment. A fear that things aren't going to work out. A fear that something bad's going to happen. Amen? He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Praise the Lord. Now, this is not a threat for us. I'm saying he's talking about people who will not come to Christ. That's all there is left. Amen? Verse 35, she despite unto the Spirit of grace, hath done. Amen? Verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Praise the Lord. So, let me close with this. If, if we are to be afraid of anything, 
or ashamed of anything. It shouldn't be the evil behavior that we sometimes do. It shouldn't be failure. It shouldn't be sin in terms of behavior or performance. Instead, if we're going to be afraid of or ashamed of anything, it ought to be just simply our present unbelief. Just not believing that it is finished. That Jesus has done everything and he's done it perfectly and we are accepted in him, in the beloved. That God wants to pour out blessing and favor and goodness and mercy. And he wants us to come expecting it. To come as a child. Not fearful, not, you know, what's he going to do? But to come boldly and just run to him and expect him to bless us. Hallelujah. Amen. We look at the suffering of Jesus and we think, isn't that good enough to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Isn't that enough to reconcile us to God? Amen? That's what we have to continually remind ourselves of. It is sufficient. He said it's all about the sufficiency of Christ. And that's why he said, my grace is sufficient. For anything, for everything, for all things. And we need to continually renew our minds to this truth. We need to constantly be submersing ourselves in the gospel, in the cross, in the atonement, in the finished work of Jesus that gives us this acceptance with God. God's love poured out on us without consideration for our flesh, but totally considering Jesus and his finished work that has made us acceptable. We have been robed in righteousness. We are in Christ. We are accepted by God. We are more than accepted. We are loved. And God pursues us with his love so that we can have a clear conscience before God and before one another. Can you say praise the Lord? Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah. (laughs) Thank the Lord. Amen, amen. God bless everybody. Appreciate you being here. Thank you for allowing me to be honest. And as soon as my bodyguards get here, I'll be leaving. Praise the Lord. <laughs> 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 That's right. Do we all have to stay now? Yeah. No. Thank you.